Hi, everybody. I'm Deanna Kosaraju, founder of Global Tech Women. Thank you to everyone who has been participating in the last few sessions. They have been fabulous. We just left a great session on engaging men in gender competence. It was very interesting to hear from the male perspective about gender. And now we switch to uh, the issue of intervention programs and the programs that companies put in place to recruit and retain women. And there is nobody that I know that is more an authority in this area than Sonia Bernhardt, who will be speaking with us. She is the CEO of Thoughtware. And I understand that she has a new book coming out, which um, I can't wait to get my hands on. Uh, so I look forward to hearing this talk. So Sonia, um, I will be going off air, but I will be able to hear you. So if you have any needs from me, just uh, yell and I will come back on. A couple of things to let you know, you have to be logged in uh, to participate in the chat window that's over on the right hand side. I see we have a few visitors. If you're a visitor, you cannot use the chat, but we encourage everyone to use the chat and use it as an opportunity to network with one another. Um, we are asking you to submit questions using the question box, which you can find directly below Sonia and me down below. And um, we will, I'll queue those questions for Sonia when she's ready for them. And then also uh, 30 minutes after this session concludes, the recording will be available on this very same link. So you can go back to the program page and view the, the recording anytime you like. And again, feedback is always welcome. I love to hear feedback. If, if you come up with a, an idea or a suggestion, email me at Deanna at globaltechwomen.com. Tweet it, put it on our amazing Facebook group with our very active Facebook community. Um, we have engaging conversations daily on various topics of interest for women in tech around the world. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sonia. Thanks very much, Deanna. Hi. Um, well, I'm going to do something today that you may end up all hating me for. I'm going to uh, cover a topic that many people have passionately spent many years involved in, but I'm going to present it in such a way that uh, even if you do hate what I have to say, um, I'm hoping that will help engage everybody into a conversation. So, Based on a review of the literature, industry experience and anecdotal evidence from women in IT, I'm going to put myself out there and be a bit brave and potentially controversial and I'm going to say this. All of that work about all of those intervention programs and all the significant girl and women in IT programs have failed. In fact, I'm going to go one step further and I'm going to say it has been a massive global failure. And in fact, it's time to stop. So there's my presentation. Now, there's a lot of stuff behind it, so let's get into that. In this presentation, I'm going to step through why. Why is this a failure? What is it that we have been doing wrong? And what do I believe, and I hope that you will stay with me and you'll listen to, what are the real reasons and causes behind it? And like all good presentations, I'm going to round off by proposing solutions. I'm going to have a look at um, things that we can uh, learn from these past experiences and what we can do so do stay with me because there's light at the end of this failure tunnel. When I say failure, what do I actually mean? So let me begin by a definition of failure. And to me, it's important to begin with this because it helps frame why I'm claiming that around the world, there's been this huge failure. Let's have a look at a couple of definitions or just Google it, pick it up on Wiki, you'll find out. It's a condition or fact of not achieving a desired end or ends. It's an act that fails. It's an event that does not accomplish its intended purpose. Now, keep that in mind as we step through these next bits. So in the context of this presentation, what I'm saying is that 
projects such as, and you know them all, you've probably run some, you've been involved in them, you might have sponsored some, you've been actively engaged in mentoring, role modelling, career events, hands-on sessions, guest presentations, company visits. You know these have been run all around the world in an attempt to not only stem the decline in enrolments of girls in ICT studies, but to look at overall improving the statistics and the numbers of females that have undertaken technology and often science careers. So I'm saying the failure is based on the inability to meet that and we'll come back to that shortly. Let's have a look at who has got involved in these things. In my world, I know we have WIT, FIT, Digits, CC4G has come in over from uh, UK. In um, USA, you've got NCWIT, you've got WIC. In Australia here, we've also got AYS. There's Global ACM, W. It's a veritable Ackerman nightmare of organisations that around the world have been running multitudes of programs. And you probably know, even the United Nations has got involved and has set up a number of different committees associated with this. What I'd like you to do is this. Pause and think, just for a few seconds in your own environment, how many women and girls in technology groups and acronyms have you come across? Then consider, what is it that they have aimed to do? Think about what they stand for and then re-look at that in the light of facing the reality of what we all know and has been extremely well documented and that's this, that over time, in particular over the last couple of decades, the number of girls and women in technology has declined. There has been a rapid decline over time. There's the failure. The fact, that fact means that all of those groups, all of those governments, all of those corporations, all of those passionate people that wanted to make a difference have failed. The decline has not stemmed. In actual fact, it's got worse. You know, the, those of you amongst the audience that are researchers, you can lay your hands on those statistics. And in fact, I probably read them in part of my uh, book. I covered heaps and heaps of uh, those statistics. No activity to date has actually revealed the secret. And that's what everybody's been looking for. What is the secret of attraction, promotion and retention strategies? And what are the actions that we need to undertake. Um, I wonder if I can pop in and ask a question because somebody has just posted a fabulous question here and I've got the answer to that too. And the question is, I wonder if there would have been fewer women in tech if those organisations hadn't been in place. Thank you, Karen. That's exactly the question to ask. And in fact, there's a case for saying that perhaps the interference via the intervention programs is what's caused the decline. Who knows? There's a lot of research on it and when we get to the end, I've got some recommendations about how we can deal with that. But do keep that in mind as well because one thing I discovered when I was doing my, I'm, I'm not an academic. I run a software development house and I've been passionately involved. You might have seen I have a bit of passion in the topic. I've been passionately involved in this for over 20 years. But when I knew I needed to write this book, I needed to get into the researchers world. And I, I, I've referenced over 470 reference works. And one thing, Karen, that I found in that research is there's a very, very close tie between when this issue was first identified and the rushing to set up these industry associations and groups to deal with the issue. And then the decline got worse. So there is potentially a case to say that we, 
those of us that have passionately and really worked hard and voluntarily put our hearts and minds into this have caused the situation and that's where I want to go further with this presentation. So uh, thanks for the question, Karen. I know like you and like I've just talked about that we've all been engaged in these programs. Therefore, my statement of this failure is a self-include statement. I'm very known in my country for this active involvement in this area. And it actually, you know, I'm not just going, woohoo, failure. I've put a lot of thought into this. It comes from consideration from a global sphere of influence and it's crossed a wide area of involvement that spanned over two decades and I've taken into account a lot of impacts and outcomes. Some of you might be thinking at this point in time, but hang on, that's not true. My own daughter or a friend that I know went to one of those career days and she now has a job in the IT industry. Or you might be thinking, I ran one of those days, it was very successful, everybody enjoyed it and we did a survey when we left and all of those people said they had a great day. However, what I'm going to say to you is this, when you look at that more closely, you'll see that whilst each program and project may have its own merit and success, at a local level, such as those results of the good feel at the end of the day, there has not been any statistical, any positive statistical improvement on the stemming decline. Therefore, fail. You might even be able to produce statistics like some that we've done here in Australia uh, when we were very keen to uh, because of major sponsors to prove the um, outcomes and the results from the day where we were able to say things like we had 18 presenters and there were 40 time slots and we had 938 school children from these ages attended and teachers came along and we gathered these responses and then we had an outstanding response rate. 93% of people left the event with a positive feeling about a career in IT. Or you could say things like prior to the event, only 33% were considering a career in IT. At the end of the event, there was a massive jump to 76% of people that said they would now consider a career in IT. Does all of that ring a bell? Have you come across those type of things? Well, I say this, despite those local successes and those feel-good comments, there has really been a massive failure of these programs. There has been no positive impact on the overall picture, full stop. And it's time for people to face up to that. It's time for all of us around the world to say, you know what, we thought we were doing the right thing, but looking at it, it wasn't. So stop. I'm hoping that the level of awareness amongst this audience and amongst the researchers with the continued voluminous research on this subject that people will now start to look at this in a different way. And I'm going to show you some different ways. In fact, speaking of research, let me point out another thing that I've found very interesting in the research. You've heard of the Encyclopedia of Gender and Information Technology. Some listeners might even be authors in it. I am, I've got a chapter in that book. That was edited by Eileen Trow, a very well respected researcher in this field. There were two volumes of that book. There were 213 entries from 295 international specialists and researchers in this field. It also includes over 4,700 references to additional works on gender and information technology that was done in order to stimulate further research. 
I know in my book I've referenced 470 additional researchers and that was a lot of work. 4,700 is like astronomical amount. However, I'm saying that the existence of even just that encyclopedia alone and the amount of input people have had to that is objective proof that we have a real issue. And I'm going to add this, the existence of that publication and the repeated themes and solutions across the nations is undeniable proof that we have a global failure. We have had a global failure to address this critical issue. I'm going to take you into your own world now and I, I want to give you a little exercise. So it's not an exam, it's not a test, it's just a little exercise that you can do in your mind or grab a quick little pen and paper because you might want to scribble down a few things. I'm going to give you this exercise so that you can quickly grasp an indication of the financial aspect and the depth of this failure so that after this session this will ring through your head and may kickstart a number of additional conversations. I'll start with this statement. If you add up the global spend of all of these projects, programs and research over just the past five years alone, I say that there is likely to be enough funds and enough effort spent that instead of all those programs, we could have established a major university or educational institution solely focused on training up women in technology and a corporation to hire them into their technology roles afterwards. Think about the difference between that and what actually happened. So here's the exercise for you. In your experience, consider how much money, including time and effort, governments, industry associations, corporations, educational institutions and volunteers have spent on this. Think about just your town where you live. Think about the group or groups that you're involved in. Just think about one activity that you've been involved in that. How much money did that cost? How much were the sponsors putting in? How much volunteer time was spent on that? Multiply that out to your region. Multiply that out to your nation. Multiply that out to the world. Multiply that out across 10 years. Multiply that out to the 20 years that this has gone on. There's the money. I'll give you an example of my own calculation. Okay, So here's a calculation of one program and I've been involved in heaps so, and, and multiple different sorts. So here's an example of one program that I've been involved in. It was an IT skills training role modelling of things that you're all very familiar with. So it provided structured mentoring. It was about identifying, skilling and promoting women with IT so that they could become ready for uh, appointment onto boards. And it was about providing a series of role models uh, at career events. All great things, right? All the things that get repeated, repeated and repeated and more money, more money, more money spent on, even although, and you can see in the notes here, a lot of these things didn't increase the numbers. Uh, there's significant involvement. And in my example, I ask you to remember this. I'm from Queensland in Australia, which overall we're like so small compared to most of you guys, right? So we, have, for example, in this, um, this one I'm going to step through for you, at that time, Queensland only had a population of 4 million people, okay? Um, so that activity, we attracted 1,600 participants, we had over 100 involved in the mentoring, we had almost 400 on the board readiness, and we conducted role modelling to uh, 1,200 young girls. We reached beyond the city into the regions and the rural areas, which is often another 
aim of these programs. Let's get beyond the city, let's go out into the regions. We built tools, we left behind tools for people to use, a structured mentoring kit, video tools, etc. lots of things. In that program, we actually um, spent only $150,000, but you need to remember we're small, so in your area, that might be one and a half million. Um, and that was for those four projects. If I calculate that out, and Queensland is only 50, 15% of the Australian population and at that time I know other states were spending heaps more money but just sticking with the Queensland example, that works out to $5 million over five years spent here in Australia on something that failed. And maybe one or two girls went on for a career in IT. Uh, lots of people felt happy on the day, they feel happy when they go to a concert too. So um, that's a bit of an example. I'll give you another one at an extreme end while you're scribbling down your own examples. Those of you from the UK, you know about the UKRC. When funding was cut to UK Resource Centre in um, 2011, it was identified that £2.5 million was the annual funding given to that one group to assist with women in IT. See what I mean about huge statistically number wise and I notice I'm yeah blah, 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 blah. I've got so much more to say I'm part way through I must I must move on I've labored uh, the point too much I think you get the idea that there's a significant amount of wasted money that nobody's quantified but you starting from your own area can quantify it and in the end we're talking billions billions of dollars around the world has been spent on this that has failed and then we've got indirect costs as well. So I'll just um, jump ahead a little bit. Um, so I'd like to take that failure situation and present it to you this way. As I said, I'm not a researcher, I'm a business person. So I look at it this way and I go, if the declining numbers of women and girls in IT was a commercial project, and I, as a chairperson or the CEO, had been presented that millions in just my area had been spent on that project and it had failed, it hadn't even come close to achieving its stated aims, despite sincere and extended efforts, I wouldn't call it a failure, i call it a catastrophe. I would ax that program from my business and wipe it. It's throwing good money after bad because it continues to not deliver on the bottom line. It delivers other tiny little things, but it doesn't deliver on what the overall purpose actually is. And in fact, whenever is it acceptable that something that continually fails, you just keep doing? You just pick up the same stuff, you do a minor modification and you just repeat it. You just go and get more money. Or if you're a sponsor and you're putting money into these programs, why do you keep doing it? You get a little report that tells you the people that attended on the day, but then you see that the underlying results are not producing, but you keep funding it. Maybe it's time to actually consider that. Maybe it's time to it's not about blaming the people, it's about what it is that we're doing because it is year after year, country after country that this is occurring in. So there has to be a fundamental flaw in what we're doing because those of us who do it, we know we do it with all the right intentions and we put so much work into it and it keeps failing. So go back to basic business. It's fundamentally flawed. So let's have a look at where we can go with that. How are you feeling? Comfortable? Uncomfortable? Because I can tell you this, when my, all this went around in my mind and I realised this and I've put decades of volunteer time and unbelievable amounts of my own funding into these efforts, it's a crunch because Facing reality, 
and the uncomfortable truth that something that you did full of good intentions and where you've put your mind, your heart and your soul and your money into, but it's declared a failure. If you're currently feeling, if, oh, if you're current, I'm just reading this, side talk. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, ha, that was funny. Gotcha. <laughs> Thanks, Deanna. You scared me then. <laughs> okay. Um, if you're currently feeling uncomfortable, Hang in there, <laughs> hang in there, we'll get there, okay. Um, so, you know, it's far more important to um, face the reality than avoid the discomfort and controversy. And Deanna, in response to the little question, what you're doing is one of the, my recommendations and, and I'm about to get to them, so, <laughs> but uh, hang in there, but I'm glad I'm getting into your heartstrings there, so no worries. <laughs> um, the facts are this, look, whilst Every individual success is worthwhile. If the only sign of success that we have out of all of these huge efforts is a few individuals, then we have to question, just like we have been questioning the questions there is, is the effort worth it overall? What is it that we're doing wrong? And how do we turn this all around? So, um, we keep on doing it and we keep on doing it because we're passionate, but let's have a look at other things that we can do. Instead of staying in a mad cycle of doing the same old thing over and over again with this, you know, little impact and reduced sphere of influence, we seriously do need to analyse why and we need to analyse the world where it is today. So let's have a look at some of the factors that I think that have come into play that make this whole situation extremely different. First I'll have a drink of water, hang 10, I'm pretty sure you know I've been blah, 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 so I need more water, hang on. Okay, I believe that moving forward what we need to do is not just play with digital disruption, we now need to absolutely recognise that we are in a very digitally disruptive environment. And what we need to, well, you know, here's the example. By that I mean we're so in a new era. With those of us that are older that started in this 10, 20 years ago, you know the changes. Those of you that have just entered into it, you don't know this seismic difference that there is now. But what you do know is what the programs you're getting are the ones you've inherited from those of us from a past era who haven't adjusted, uh, with the great exception to this uh, particular conference. So uh, this new era that we're in, and you know this, every Facebook post, every tweet, every Pinterest, every meme, every Instagram upload, Tumblr share, dig, you know, uh, YouTube, hangouts, crowdsourcing projects, and social media groups and communities can make a difference. Um, so the, uh, social media has grown from the early days of just basic connection through to conferences such as this one, through to extremes such as these extremes that you've probably heard of. And these are extremes that have been supercharged by social tools. And we need to supercharge the women in IT issue and social tools is one way to do it. Here are these extremes, the Arab Spring. You're probably all across it, you know about it. The, the initial one in 2011, where the whole government was overthrown and triggers for that were the social networks that sprang up as a source of news and a means for people to gather and to get together and to ignite social change. Similarly, in Pacific Islands, there is a deregulation of telecommunications that's resulted in a significant digital change there as well. Mobile phones now have become the force of groups and online groups gathering and prom um, promoting opinions and debates and coordinating activities. They are the things that we need to um, start using. I've just got to rush through. I've got so much and I know I've only got another half hour and there's some really fabulous points. Oh, probably, hopefully. Hopefully you feel I've already made some fabulous points, but I've got solution points that I want to make at the end. So I'm just going to skip a couple of um, things. 
um, Karen's just asked a question in there. Is your premise that grow the number of women in tech is the goal for all women in IT intervention programs? Um, the real answer to that is only each of the individual programs can tell you what their overall goals were. The majority of ones that you can access via websites, etc., tend to all have an underlying statement about the state of the rapid decline of girls and women in IT, and it's about overall improving that. But it's a good question to answer, Karen, because it actually almost segues me into one of the reasons why I think things have been uh, dealt with uh, 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 and resulted in um, failures is a fundamental flaw in the way that it's been thought about, and uh, we will come with that. And another valuable point's just been posted in the chat there, that what people say and what they actually do are often two different things. And I totally agree. How many times have you been to events where the majority of people there are the middle layer? The other lawyers or the business people or the recruiters and that it doesn't actually deal with the grassroots that these organisations are saying that they're actually trying to get to. And therefore, we've got a whole heap more funds that have been spent on stuff that's not getting to the grassroots. So um, I, I deal with a lot of that in um, my upcoming book, which I'll just give you a little bit about uh, um, towards the end. Um, okay, the point about that whole digital disruption thing is that it's all around us and it's significant and we need to get into it a whole lot more than even just using tools here for a fabulous conference such as this one. And look, don't get me wrong, please. I'm not saying that people are not using tools at the moment. I'm fully aware that we've got a multitude of um, uh, subcultures, like, I don't know, but do you know there's Twitter groups that are based on platforms such as the Linux Chicks in Peru or the Web Girls. There's communities based on geography or ethnicity. You've probably all heard of the Black Girls Code. There's Latinas in computing. There's girls in tech in New York City. You know, there's groups based on the stage of life, such as Geek Girl Coffees, which is the students. There's tech girls. There's teen tech girls. There's so many. There's so many um, that um, have sprung up that are using technology. I just think that there's a heap of other ways to tap into it that are even smarter. That'll give us that that Arab Spring and the digital revolution in the Pacific Islands instead of just a little bit, a little bit. So um, I'm just saying that the pervasiveness of it, in fact, I'll lean forward and quietly say this to you. I actually firmly believe this, that it's time for the traditional women and girl in IT groups to close down. I actually think that the old, overstructured, formalised, traditional groups need to stop and give way to the, the new formation that have grown from the grassroots themselves. I actually think it's time to toss away the past approaches and move forward. So that's a little bit about moving forward, but what have we been doing wrong? I told you I'd address that issue, so let's have a look. We know for decades we've all been worried about this. And we know that um, there's been so much research and everything done with it. Um, and we know, and for those of you who are researchers, you know that there are so many barriers that have been drawn up. There's so much in um, a cultural and um, um, other barriers that have been named that uh, cause this. But my main thing is this, almost all of those theories and those interventions have been based on a gender approach. And solutions have been viewed from a gender lens. Everybody looking at this is using a gender approach to what they're actually looking at. Uh, and they've, they've linked this gender approach to increasingly subtle and insidious barriers that are the reason why there's a lack of women in IT. To me, that gives an impression that women are a herd of frightened deer and that they're ready to run away. But you and I know that that's not how women in IT see themselves. 
Women and girls interested in the STEM fields see themselves as interested, competent, and above all, as people who regard obstacles as a challenge to be met and overcome. You and I also know that there are statistical differences between men and women. In fact, it's often said. You've probably said things yourself. One of the reasons why we need more women in IT is so that the different viewpoint gets brought into the development of the technology. We might have different products if women in IT were involved. That's a fundamental acceptance that there is a difference between men and women bringing that different viewpoint. What do I think? To me, I see that the failure point is not about gender. I see that because all of the solutions have been tailored around that gender viewpoint, I believe that because it's not that women aren't interested in IT, there's so much data that shows that young girls and women really, really do love technology. The, the issue is this, the career choice, it's more than just ability and interest. It takes being more interested than in any other choice that's available. I'll just repeat that. I'm just saying that women are as good in IT, we don't have to prove that point. We know, in fact, we shouldn't even be comparing against men. If anything, we should be comparing within our genders. So, um, and we know that you know girls are interested, etc., and they 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 they'll have some kind of interest. But the pulling point here is they're interested in lots of things, and it actually takes not just ability and interest; it takes being more interested than in something else. And I believe that's the secret. The secret is not approaching this from a gender approach. It's about approaching it from not telling girls how much we enjoy IT. It's about understanding what matters, what they are interested in. It's about understanding what individually each person is interested in. It's not about throwing all of the girls together into one gender group. It's not about a one solution fits all. It's about trying to get more curious, creative and clever people into IT. It's not about getting more girls into IT. Lots of women that are already in IT really don't like being uh, marginalised by being put in a women's group. And if the approach is more about curious, creative and clever, that helps to get around that kind of issue. Still got to jump, I'm still, <laughs> sorry, I've been talking too much. Hope I haven't been driving you crazy. Oh, actually, I'm not doing too bad. I'm getting somewhere towards the end, which is really good. Okay. I'll just repeat that in other words. A fundamental solution, I believe, to the issue is women are unique individuals. It's by promoting the idea that it's the individual who matters, it's the individual who thinks and has the talent. That kind of approach will also mean that one day people will be judged as individuals on their own merits not according to prejudice based on gender or ethnicity. It's not up to us to decide what other people should be interested in. You know, I've spent decades doing that and it hasn't worked. You know, just because I love it doesn't mean everybody else is going to. It doesn't mean I can push it onto other people. But it is up to us to do what we can to empower individuals, whoever and wherever they are, so that their interests can be addressed. Let them choose their own path. So what I'm going to do is actually lead into some recommendations. First, I'll just summarise those uh, key points that I've uh, made, and I'll summarise and lead into a few recommendations. 
Okay, so I've covered a few kind of topics there, but they are all linked and they're linked brilliantly together in my book. Um, so these are them for decades. Governments, researchers and traditional industry associations and groups have A, identified that there's a problem, B, banded together to act and implement solutions. The vast majority of those solutions have been designed from a gender viewing lens which in itself may have meant the people you're trying to get to, you don't get to, because they don't want to be marginalised in that way. Two, we're in an era of digital disruption and pervasive social media tools that we should be tapping into. Three, with the obvious exception of circumstances that limit access, such as poverty or a strong cultural bias, there have been no noted issues or problems for females' participation or use with technology. In fact, in a number of areas, females are avid users of new and emerging technologies. But this issue is not about using technology. This issue is about creating, being the creators, being the curious, creative designers and the clever people behind the technology. Number four, women and very specifically in relation to IT, women should be viewed as individuals, not as a collective gender group or as a one solution fits all. Okay, so are you all with me? Because if you are, I'm going to drop down to a couple of, in fact, I'm just going to give you two primary recommendations. In um, in my book, which actually does come out this month, it's IGI Publishing, so you can Google it. It's called Women in IT in the New Social Era. Um, I present these primary high-level recommendations, but I include 35 detailed recommendations that are structured around this new approach. I even propose a new model for um, how, well, a model that you know builds on previous models, but it's done in a totally different way three-dimensional kind of uh, way. So here we go, recommendation number one. And I started with recommendation number one. Guess what it is? Stop. Stop reinventing past intervention programs. Stop bringing historical viewpoints and issues into today's world. Stop viewing the issue through a gender or a social lens that actually all that really does to me is it just sees an individual as putty moulded by the world. See the individual as the core. Stop pushing your solutions and let individuals and society organically evolve their solutions as is what's starting to happen through a whole heap of um, social media things that are occurring. And what does that shift mean? Well, to me, that means our underlying statement, we need to, from, we need to encourage more women, we need to change that to become, we need to engage more curious, creative and clever people in IT. Focus on the individual interests. Treat people as the individuals and unique selves. My second recommendation, it's pretty simple, it's equally as simple, it's probably ironic because it's don't stop. It's an enthusiastic, continue to be passionate and inspired, but in so doing, recognise that the world is changing and it's far more rapidly than ever before. We need to shift our methods and our approaches to those that now belong in our new um, tectonically changing world that we now inhabit. Embrace all of these technologies and collaborate using the tools and the platforms such as what we're doing here and um, use that to build new models. Build things and activities that incorporate crowdsourcing, open innovation, transparency, co-creation, collaboration, and they are the areas that I've done in details in, um, in my discussions. Uh, and, oh, one other thing. Something that you've 
all been waiting for? I'm finished. Questions? I see a question here about leaky pipeline. Um, I address that in um, in my book. There's the problem with the leaky pipeline is it assumes that there's a linear approach. People start a career here, then they go here, then they go here, then they go here, and oops, they drop out here because they're uh, having babies or getting married or something like that. Um, we know our lives aren't like that. Very rarely do we start here and go there. We go round and round and round and round, pretty representative of our wombs. We're, we, we're, we're not linear and the leaky pipeline analogy, whilst it was a very useful analogy for a period of time, the fundamental flaw with that analogy is it is assuming that there is a structured one way only pathway to get somewhere. Uh, so. I only got a handful of people left with me. Thank you. But um, do you have any questions? I can see now I jumped through some stuff that I could have covered it, but anyway, whatever. Um, we'll just see there's none in there. Want to post me any? No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, there are leaks, though, on the roundabout of careers, correct, Karen. There are, but you know what? It shouldn't be called a leak. It should just be that's what happens. That's what happens in an individual's life. And where your career has taken you, Karen, the leak might be at that point, whereas in my career, the leak might be at this point. And I think the whole analogy of saying it's a leak, meaning is there's something wrong, you know? But then again, I'm a bit weird here because I also don't like to use the word balance because <laughs> I think that implies something's wrong too. I think that means if you're doing uh, the thing with a balance between work and you know home is if you're doing a little bit more at home, it means work suffering. So I don't like that type of analogy, but you know that's just me. Um, but I say it's just me, and you know, see the grey hair. I've got a bit of experience somewhere in there. Any other questions? I'm um, a uh, mindful of research and answers. Actually, I was hoping that Carolyn Simard was going to be in on this because I use a lot of her research in the book. Okay, that must be sort of. So I guess I say. Thanks. At least I've left your time to go to your next session. <laughs> so, you're good. Oh. See if I missed any. Typing's terrible. <laughs> uh, pity I can't get in and fix that. What I just wrote was, I told you to make you feel uncomfortable, but sometimes a viewpoint expressed helps ignite new thinking. That's actually my goal. <laughs> my goal is to ignite the new thinking on this because, uh, hey, I want that educational institution that uh, is specifically about technologies. Actually, I'm not that much on universities um, because, again, I think that's old world thinking. But um, a yeah. institution okay, of you. some I, you kind, know, you, you know, virtually question, done. It's something that's been rolling through my mind, and this is a big debate we've been having over on uh, the Global Tech Woman Facebook page. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Sonia? Okay, oh, hello. Okay. 
Yes, um, I can. We've been having this yes. debate about the whole um, hour of code, yes. the girls who code. Um, you know, every girl should be coding, every boy should be coding. And um, I see this very similarly to what was happening, say, 10 years ago with women in technology. It's a similar vein where, you know, everyone has to be doing this. Um, and there's a lot of women developers who think that this is the wrong approach. What's your what thoughts on this? Yeah, um, uh, I've got two viewpoints on, yep, thank you for asking because I've been following that. I know Obama came out with a big statement that everybody needs to do that. Um, on the surface it sounds great, but you know what? I don't agree with it. <laughs> um, and the reason why I don't agree with it is because you, my underlying premise here is it's about an individual. And in actual fact, my own research and other research is clearly showing that girls that are interested in IT actually know they're interested in IT at a very, very early stage or partway through their life, they get exposed through the course of work or you know early stage schooling and realise that they really like it. So my objection to that everybody should learn to code is it might turn people off. They might feel they're being forced to do it, therefore they're going to hate it. I mean, you know, we, we hot out about you. I don't particularly like stuff that is a, 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 an enforced uh, push to do something. I might just buck up and not do it or, you know, get away from it. So I actually think that it sounds good, but I don't support or agree with it. Where do we go? Did that get captured? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I guess uh, this has been a fascinating talk, and you know, Charlotte had to get ready for her presentation, but she came on there and she said, "Wow, what a you know, what an amazing uh, conversation we were having <clears throat> over there." So I, I think it's it's the beginning, and I'm really glad that your book is coming out because I think that we need to get real with ourselves about where we're at um, with women in technology. Uh, you know, I've, I've worked for organizations that really became just the recruiting vehicle because, you know, the multinationals had a recruiting number that they had to hit and that was considered, quote unquote, a success. But then, you know, after years of watching these girls go through university and then they would go work for that company, I would never see them again. And then after a few years, they dropped. Uh, so, you know, the, we just never did anything to address that pipeline at all. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I really like what you just said. <laughs> um, it's time to get real about this issue. <laughs> you know, we should make that a slogan <laughs> uh, because it is, it, it is very, very, and ultimately that's my message. My message is stop hanging on to your hopes and dreams <laughs> and the old way you used to do it, and let's get real about it. I'm not saying there's no issue. I'm not saying don't do anything at all. I'm just saying let's get real about it and go back to the drawing board, which I know a lot of people hate that, but we've got a wonderful uh, new technology drawing board to go back to. And I tell you, honestly, I should reveal to you some of my recommendations. Like I've got some incredibly awesome recommendations in my book that when it went under the um, double blind peer review, they wrote back and said this book has to be published. It has to be published because it's saying things that has never been said before. And I've got um, a couple that so I think significantly when, uh, use the old information, it, um, but in a brand a new way. That we do every month. I think that this should be one of the books and we should invite all of our friends that are in this space and have a discussion about this. I, I would yeah. really be interested in hearing the thoughts of, uh, there's a number of people we have to invite to have a conversation about this. And I, I would love to hold that. Yeah. Yep. Now, to do that, what I'd need to do is, because it's a disgusting price, it's $195 a book uh, because it's, you know, uh, done as a reference book. Yeah, I know. But what I do is, once it's published, I've got permission to give, like, the uh, recommendations. Yeah. I could give a couple of the chapters and the recommendations to your book club to look at that. 
and yeah. to uh, yeah. to go now, through you know, it. Yeah, when, yeah. Because it's targeting, it's targeting universities yeah, like and governments and researchers. Of, you know, really addressing the problem. Yeah. and <laughs> libraries. Can't afford it because we're making no money because there's no corporate sponsors because <laughs> we're trying to do the right thing, right? <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, yeah, there you go. I know that. Exactly, exactly. No, I know that, but that's fine because I've got all the material okay. and I just have to wait till I've got it, you know. And um, I've already asked them, I've already asked for permission to, you know, provide some of it. Um, you sh I've okay. drawn right. up a gorgeous so three dimensional to model to explain it as well. So I can give you that and the conclusions, recommendations, and chapter summaries. And anyone who's watched this session, if you're interested, sign up for our book club, sign up for our newsletter, and we'll get this on yep, the calendar, sure. Sonia. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been. This session, I could talk about this stuff for days. I mean, this is my passion too. So yeah, no I worries. Thanks. Appreciate all the Thanks. thought and effort that you're doing to really make this possible. So thank you so much. All right, everybody, we're going to hang up now because we have to get over to our next session. But um, I hope you enjoyed thank this, you. and I thank hope you. if you're watching Bye. the recording, you get out as much out of this as uh, we did. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at future sessions. Take care, everybody.